here on the shore I see a lot of shells. There you have a soft shell clam shell. And of course there's live clams out there in the mud. Slipper shell. There's a periwinkle snail. That's a little periwinkle. Here you have a ribbed mussel. That's common here in the river. He's covered with barnacles. That's a hard shell clam. It's also called a quahog. Oh, here's another interesting creature. Let's see. Maybe if I put this in a Ziploc bag, it might be a little easier to see it. The naturalist friend, the Ziploc bag. So right in there is a hermit crab. And that's a crab that doesn't have a hard shell, so he has to find one. And he'll find an empty snail shell and take up residence in there. And as he grows bigger and bigger, of course, he's got to move and find a bigger shell. This is sea lettuce. It's pretty obvious why it's called sea lettuce. Looks just like lettuce. I'm not going to have any on my salad, but you should know that seaweed is used in a lot of different products, like toothpaste. Let's see if there's anything around the rock here. Yep, here's a little mud snail. These are the snails that you see almost carpeting the bottom of the river. There's so many of them. Mud snail. Well, we talked about some plants that are not native to the woods that we just walked through. And here's a crab that is not native to the Nisiquag River. It's called the Asian shore crab. And they arrived here about two decades ago, and they've been spreading ever since. There's large numbers of them. Any of these rocks that you turn over here are gonna have a lot of these crabs. And there's some concern that they might be pushing some of the native species of animals out. Although I've heard they make pretty good blackfish bait. They arrived here in ship's ballast. When the ships would um, take on ballast, in Asia, they would also suck up some of these crabs and their larvae when they would come here and discharge the ballast so that they could pick up cargo. All the crabs and the larvae were discharged out into our bays and that's how they arrived here. Shrimp. It's a okay. shrimp that lives here in the river. And again, a really important source of food for a lot of those game fish that we talked about stripers, snapper bluefish will eat those, weak fish, and uh, probably eels as well. All kinds of things eat grass shrimp. All right. Let me just check my book. I want to make sure I... Redbeard sponge. It's a brightly colored reddish-orange sponge that grows right here along the shoreline of the Nisiquag River. Also, here's an oyster shell. Still, still see the two halves of the shell connected. And right next to it is this, which is called an oyster drill. And this is a type of snail that can actually drill with its rasping tongue right through the shell of the oyster so that it's able to uh, eat the animal that's inside the shell. This is a razor clam and it's so named because it looks like an old-fashioned razor and they burrow down into the mud vertically like that. They can dig really fast. There's a foot at the bottom and they can dig much faster than you or I can dig after them. The green crabs actually originally come from Europe. They arrive much in the same way as the Asian shore crabs uh, they're established here now. They've been here really for uh, about a hundred some odd years and they're frequently used for blackfish bait and they don't seem to be a harm to the ecology. In fact, they've found a niche and uh, seem to be 
fitting in quite well into the ecosystem. And it looks like these two are uh, involved in a little romance, which I might have interrupted, which is probably why the big crab on top there, the male, was uh, trying to pinch me. I guess I would feel kind of the same way, so maybe we'll just let them go back about their business making little green crabs. It's low tide, but they're up and about, scrambling around the beach looking for food. They have burrows at the bottom of which there's water, so they're able to keep their gills wet by going down into the burrow periodically. You'll see a few little holes here. And I see a male crab over there through the Spartina. But the male with the big cl uh, claw certainly does look a bit like a fiddle and when they're waving it around it kind of looks like they're playing a little fiddle tune. That's an arrowhead right there along the river. Well here's more evidence of how important this river has been to so many people for so long that the edge here has definitely been worked by a chipper. They would use a, uh, another rock to chip the edge off of a quartz piece to create a blade. It's very symmetrical too. If you look at that, you'll see it's too regular just to be a broken piece of quartz. A bit of a stem there, and this is where the arrowhead would have been bound to the shaft of the arrow, the wooden part that would be fired from the bow. I believe there was a tribe that was uh, referred to as the Nessequake, if I uh, understand uh, history correctly. And they found this to be a great place to live, just like you and me. There's abundant resources of we've seen shellfish, fin fish, deer, uh, other animals to support them. And they would have had access to the waterways, so they would have been able to travel, to trade with other tribes. So it was a really great situation for them to be living in. My daughter found an arrowhead just a little bit to the uh, east of here in San Remo, also along the river. And we took that out to an Indian museum and they identified that arrowhead as being upwards of 3,000 years old. Now I don't know if this one is as well. Looks like the same style. So maybe the last person to touch this was walking along this river 3,000 years ago.